So for this morning, I'd like to talk about uh, what, what I would consider a, a basic topic, but that doesn't mean it's an easy topic, and it doesn't mean it's a simple topic. It's a foundational topic. And we're going to talk about four different aspects of this idea of God's justice and what that means. Biblical definitions of justice, you can find this idea of fairness. It emphasizes the importance of fairness and impartiality in all human interactions, regardless of status or position. As we're going through this slideshow, think about some examples that, uh, that you use to bolster your own walk and your own faith in God. In the Old Testament, this is exemplified in law that forbids the rich from oppressing the poor and commands them to treat strangers and foreigners as if they're native-born citizens. You also see the idea of righteousness as a concept that's closely linked to justice. Biblical justice requires people to act in accordance with God's laws and commandments which are believed to be just and righteous. Basically, God is the moral expert. He is the person that gets to decide morality. He's the person that gets to decide what's good and what's not good. And there's also, oh, there it is, moral integrity. Another key aspect, this includes honesty and accountability and responsibility. The Bible teaches that Justice requires people to act and to reflect their moral and ethic values the way that God requires. And he holds these people, he holds us accountable for our actions. So not only does God tell us what is expected, he rewards based on how you behave with that information. In Leviticus chapter 19, we read, in verses 33 through 37, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. Is this something that we see practiced today with foreigners residing in a land that's not theirs? The foreigner resides among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ephah and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Let all my decrees and all my laws, or keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. I am the Lord. So with God's instruction to the nation of Israel, it was not any different than what we have today. It was spelled out more explicitly than what we have in the New Testament, where he says, in this particular case, the foreigner, the person that isn't a native born, the immigrant, were supposed, they were supposed to treat as if they were native born. They were supposed to show them love as if they were themselves. They were supposed to set the standard and be an example to everyone around of what God's justice and God's expectation was. We have some examples of God's justice in the Bible. We have examples of punishment for those that don't obey him, those that are wicked. By definition, those that don't obey God's commandments are, are classified in his eyes as wicked. And those that do obey God's commandments are classified as righteous. Some of the examples that we see in the Bible are of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. We talked about this in the adult class, but a, a summary of this, there was a city that was known for being sinful. And God told Abraham that he was going to destroy the city. And Abraham said, well, what if there's so many righteous in the city. And God said, well, then I won't destroy it if there's that many. And that happened multiple times until God said, I won't destroy it if there's 10. But if there wasn't, 
God said he was going to destroy it. And what happened was God pulled out the righteous, the very few righteous that were in the city, and then destroyed the city. What good is justice if it never gets executed? If the, if the God of the Bible says, I'm going to do this over and over and over and over again, but the punishment never lands. We've all probably seen this with uh, parent and child relationships. The parent that says, I'm going to tell you one last time, but they've said that the last 20 times. And it never happens. Whatever that punishment is, I'm going to take away your toy. The kid goes, my parent is never going to enforce this boundary. So how loving is it that God's justice is exemplified and he says, I will destroy this. I will end this sin. I will end this category. And he does it. And then again, the vindication end of things, the other side of the coin, where God rewards the righteous. We have examples of that, including the story of Job, who went through tremendous persecution and pain and loss. And because he still loved God and gave God glory and did not curse God, God recompensed him. He vindicated him. He exacted justice by restoring Job even stronger than he was before. We're going to read a little bit about this. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 through 6. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. They are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are warped and crooked generation. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? This is an example of God being the moral authority. We may, we may have our own ideas about justice and injustice. But God is the one that gets the first and final say. He is the only rock. He is the only source of what is right and what is wrong. And our job as Christians, our job as followers of God, is to make ourselves adopt his instruction, adopt his position. The role of justice in God's character. We can see justice in God's character that's closely tied to many of his other attributes like love, mercy, and holiness. It's an expression of his righteousness and his commitment to uphold what is right and just. So if there's a group of people that are persecuting the people that follow God, God has said that he will, take, he will make that right in the end. He's instructed us as Christians that it's not our role, it's not our position to make justice happen. It's not our job to exact vengeance. It's not our job to be the executor of justice. God ensures that justice is enforced. He is the one that punishes for sin, and he is the one that rewards for righteousness. And it's his reflection of love for us and his desire to live with us in a way that honors him. Our relationship with God is strengthened when we align ourselves with his justice and his righteousness. In Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, it says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. It's in this context that the next verses that are commonly referred to are read. But what we're told right here is we're supposed to bless those that persecute us. 
We're not supposed to be the, the avenger. We're not supposed to be the executor of justice. We're supposed to bless those that persecute us. We're supposed to live in harmony with one another. We're supposed to not be proud or conceited. Continue on, it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So you can only affect your response. We're told in verse 14 that we're supposed to bless those that persecute us. Verse 18 isn't saying that we're supposed to make those that persecute us stop that. We're told that we're supposed to bless those that persecute us. Our response, our portion of that relationship is supposed to be peaceful. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. With all of that in mind, he continues on. He says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will reap, keep coal, burning coals on his head. Do not become, or, or do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We can tie this back to what God's mindset is from the Old Testament, that he tells his people, you're supposed to treat foreigners, you're supposed to treat those that aren't natural born, that aren't native born, as if they were. You're su supposed to treat them as well as you treat yourselves. You're supposed to love them like you love yourself. Our job is to overcome evil with good. In this whole discussion of justice, we have to talk about the result of sin. As it was mentioned back in the book of Deuteronomy, God is our creator. He gifted us with this life. We didn't do anything to earn it. We don't deserve it. It was because of his will, his pleasure. He wanted to build this. So he created us. He gave us this opportunity at life. He also created the opportunity to be obedient to him for an even greater life. Knowing that God was the one that first gave and is continuing to give, and he is the source of all righteousness, he has in his book of rule what the result of sinning or going against his instruction is. The bi biblical understanding of sin is a violation of God's law and a departure from his will. It's a transgression against God's commandments that separates us from him. Remember that he's the rock. He's the one that stays firm. What he has established doesn't change. It's us that separate from him. We have portrayals of sin in the Bible, something that's a serious offense that, against God, and it carries severe consequences. It also is depicted as a condition that affects all humans and require atonement and redemption. We got two very simple verses about sin. Both in Romans chapter 3 verse 20, 23 and chapter 6 verse 23 says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in God's justice system, sin earns death. And that's a scary thing. Death is the enemy. But God's made a way that we can atone for that. God's made a way that those sins can be wiped away, that those sins can be thrown behind his back. We all earn death when we sin. And that, thing, that seems like it's a really scary concept. But we didn't earn life in the first place. We were gifted life. We earned death. But in God's justice, he's made a way for us to be atoned for those sins. The consequences of sin 
as it's listed in the New Testament. Again, separation from God. And there's also a point at which we are eternally separated from God. When we mentioned that there was a pathway of atonement, that there was a way that we could be forgiven of these sins. Doesn't that require, though, the person being interested and willing to, to do what was required? If someone sins and doesn't care to change their way, there is no way to close that separation. Sin affects our relationship with God by creating a separation. And this separation can only be overcome through repentance and forgiveness. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read a little bit about this. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is, atoning, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This morning in the adult and teen class, we were talking about this exact moment. And we talked about how Jesus, the leading up to and the execution of him, was the focal point of God's plan. And up until, up until this point on that chart, it is the most prominent, the most important peak, the most important topic that has come to pass. It was the showing of how God intends to execute justice to those that are righteous. Jesus was killed, a sinless man, and he became this atoning sacrifice for not only the sins that those that come before him, but also those that come after. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was the pathway through which God's justice and reward for the righteous have a pathway back to God. He was the way that we can remove the separation between sinful us and God. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, we see the same sort of message in the Old Testament. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. This message from the prophet Isaiah to the people of God Pretty hard truths, pretty hard things to, to admit to yourself, knowing that it was my choice, my actions that have separated from God. And yet he started this with, God is not too weak to be able to help you, to be able to save you. And his ears still do work but he won't hear you so long as you continue in your sin. So we talked about the result of sin. What's the result of obedience as it rela relates to God's justice? So we have some, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of biblical obedience. And I think, at least for me, a lot of the time, I think, how is it that I can show my obedience to God? How can I do this one big thing to show how much I love him? And we do this as teenagers too, or young people that are getting in relationships with love interests. How can I show this person how much I love them? This one huge event. How many, how many of you that are, oh man, I'm going to age myself here. How many of you that are 30 and older did the homecoming thing the way that it's done now? Where there's a huge event leading up to asking the person to go to homecoming with you. I don't see any hands. How many, how many kids do that now? Hands? Yeah, we got hands. I'm not shaming anybody. But I'm showing that 
that that's how humans think, is how can I show this extravagant thing so that this person that I like knows how much I like them? How many of us over 30 knows that that's not the way it works? It's, it's showing this over and over and over and over and over and over again in all of the things, not just the big things, the little things too, all of the things. How many of us as kids got in trouble with their parents? How many of us thought, oh may, man, I'm grounded. Maybe I got grounded because I didn't clean my room. Maybe if I clean it really well, I won't be grounded anymore. How many of that did, did it not work for? Right? Yeah, because, oh, great. So now you've shown me you can clean your room. So for the next two weeks when you're grounded, keep that up and maybe I'll unground you. Yeah, it's not, it's not required that we have a huge labor or a huge task placed on us, like what these men that we're going to talk about had. But each one of us have that same challenge in our life. The challenge being, do what God says. It's not easy to do because we want to do what we want to do, and it doesn't always line up. Abraham obeyed God's command to leave his homeland and go, to go to a new land that God would show him. And as a result, Abraham was blessed, and he was made to become the father of many nations. That was his role. That was the, the job that God had for him. That's not the job that God's going to have for us. Very likely. However... Are there aspects of what Abraham had to go through that each one of us have to, has to go through? In, in some sense, have we had to leave some family behind? Have we had to leave some of our old man behind? Have we had to follow God in order to get the blessings? How about Moses? Moses obeyed God's command to lead his people back out of Egypt. Is that going to be something that any of us are going to do? Nope. That's not our role. And Moses remain, remained obedient to God and ultimately fulfilled his mission. But what happened to Moses right at the end of his mission? He sinned against God. And we know what the result of that was. Sin earns death. And what God told him, because Moses sinned near the end of his death, he said, you will lead these people. You will get them to the promised land, but you're not going to step foot into it. You're going to die without entering into it. And if that was the end of the story, that'd be terrible. His whole life, uh, for, since he left Egypt, if I remember right, that was around the age of 40. Maybe it was, no, it was 80. All right, yeah, I saw Shane say no. <laughs> I know he was right. A long time. And why did, he, why did he leave Egypt? Anybody remember that? At 40, right? At 40, he left Egypt because what did he do? He th took justice and vengeance into his own hands, right? He did God's job. And you'd think that the Israelites would be like, yeah, thanks for sticking up for us. That's not what happened. He had to flee for 40 years. But that's not the end of Moses' story because we read that Moses is going to be resurrected. That Moses is going to be in the kingdom. That that same thing that happened to Christ as the first fruit of those that were raised from the dead to immortality is going to happen to Moses. So Moses' story doesn't end with him dying before entering the promised land. That's just a moment of to be continued, if you've seen any TV shows or movies that have a sequel. To be continued. And the third one, Jesus had this role. Is there anyone else that can fulfill his role? Was there any more monumentous role? 
This was a big showing. This was a big event. But did Jesus do a lot of other things in his life to show his obedience? The more mundane things? The more normal day-to-day life things? The more like what we're going to have to do? None of us are going to be the perfect sacrifice. None of us are going to have to have all of the sins of humanity on our shoulders with that responsibility, that expectation. We read about how his tears were like great drops of blood asking his God and his Father, please let this path pass over me. Please let there be another way, but I'll do what you want me to. And he did. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 10 through 14, and this whole, this whole chapter is actually pretty awesome. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, and th- what the kind of a precursor here, this man Naaman was a leper. He was very ill. He had a skin disease. And Naaman had asked Elisha, hey, is there any way that I can get this taken care of? Is there any way that God will relieve me of this ailment? And Elisha responded and said to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Okay, pretty simple, pretty mundane. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Yeah, Naaman was very much like we are. Isn't there something more grandiose that I could do? Isn't there something, I mean, the Jordan's kind of a mucky, murky river. Why can't I just wash myself here in the... In the Wenatchee, it's a way cleaner river. So he went off and he was mad that he couldn't do this grandiose thing. So he turned, went off in a rage, and Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, gone on some great crusade, or gone on done some glorious act, wouldn't you have done that? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleaned? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Fortunately for Naaman, he calmed himself down, listened to the reason of his servant and said, you know what, you're right, I should swallow my pride. I shouldn't inflate my ego by saying I should have had, you know, trumpets and chariots and laying on of hands and this huge show of God's power to cleanse me of my skin ailment. I'll just do what God says, and we call that obedience. God does not ask anything more than we can handle, and he just expects us to do what he says. How about the parable of the wise and the foolish builders? Everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Storms are going to come. If we use the words of God to bolster our faith and we obey, the storms won't prevail But those who hear the words and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the storm came, it washed it away and it came down with a crash. In another parable, the parable of the talent, where God has given resources and abilities to people. Sum this up is the story of a master who entrusts his own property to his servants, and he gives one servant five talents or five abilities, and the other one two, and the other one one. The one with two and five, they use that talent. They invest that talent, and they get returns on that investment. The one that took his one talent and hid it, didn't grow it, didn't use it, didn't obey, 
he gets punished. He rebukes that servant for his laziness and his fear. And he takes that God-given talent and casts him out. Our last topic here is recompense according to the Bible. Recompense in the Old Testament is portrayed, portrayed as a form of divine judgment, closely linked to the idea and the covenant that God made with his people, where God rewards the faithful and punishes the disobedient. It's also associated with the idea of salvation and a reward for faith and obedience. And I think of Korah, Korah's rebellion, where Korah had decided that Moses was arrogant and Moses was egotistical by claiming that he was the only one that God had spoken to and that God had given the authority to lead the people. And because of this, God separates Korah and the tents of those that followed Korah away from the people of Israel. And Moses proposed to test, to determine whom God chooses between Korah and himself. Each man was to take a censer and offer incense before the Lord. And the next day, the ground opened up and swallowed Korah and his followers and all of their possessions. And then fire consumed the 250 men that were offering profane incense and that believed Korah should be the one that they followed. That book is also pretty eye-opening. We'll read a couple of verses there. It says, Then Moses said, This is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things, and that it was not my idea. If these men die a natural death and suffer the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings out brings about something totally new, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them, they will go down alive into the realm of the dead. Then you will know that these men have treated the Lord with contempt. We skipped this part, but that's what happened. The earth swallowed them. And what happens the very next day? The whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron and said, you have killed the Lord's people. So even though Moses said, you'll know that the Lord is doing this, if this happens, they still blame Moses. And yet God exacted his justice that day. We see a picture in the Bible that the righteous, righteousness and obedience is rewarded and wickedness is punished. We see examples of the reward with Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son. And God stops that sacrifice right before it happens and gives him a promise of a descendants and numerous, as numerous as the stars. And that God really will get rid of the wickedness. He will cut out that by the stories such as Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll conclude today with Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possessions. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Thank you, everyone. Let's go ahead and end with a song. Let's close our service today with song number 223, God's Way. Number two hundred and let's stand, please.
today to worship you and praise you and thank you for all of the blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for your words of salvation, your expectations, so that we know how we can follow and be obedient to your words. We ask that you forgive us when we do fall short and that you save us a place in that kingdom and that we may hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. These things we ask as it be your will and in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.